Um, let's uh, have our Bibles ready. I'm not going to have you turn anywhere right now. Uh, I don't have a very good title for this. Uh, I just wrote down some IONs uh, that come with the new birth. Uh, or that, you know, some ION's in Christianity, and you'll understand it because every one of the points ends in ION. Um, you, you've, you've studied these words, I'm sure, uh, if you've looked at the Bible much at all, but um, some of them can be confusing. Some of them aren't words we maybe use in, in uh, just as everyday, you know, talk, you know, imputation. You know, I don't really use that every day in my, you know, as I'm talking, but um, I want to kind of go through them. Uh, learn about a little bit what they are, just brief definitions on them, find out where they are in Scripture, what they represent, how we use them. Um, and it also, I think it helps us to help other people, because there's a lot of people that don't know what some of these, uh, you know, what they mean, where they apply uh, to the new birth or to the Christian life, and you can help them out with it. So if we can arm ourselves to help them at the very least, um, some of this will be just old hat for you all, but um, I have 18 and honestly, there's way more. This is, I'm going to stop at 18. And, and, you know, that's why I need two weeks is to cover, cover just these ones. Uh, so we'll start simple at the top, salvation. Get it? I-O-N. Salvation. Right, it's the first thing you got to do to be in the will of God. Uh, the Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should uh, come to repentance. So you have to be saved to be in the will of God. Salvation is the act of saving. <laughs> Surprisingly, isn't it? Uh, preservation from destruction, danger or great calamity, deliverance from enemies. And I got all of those when I got saved, uh, when I was born again. Now, this is something that's funny, and it's very interesting, and you come, uh, you come face to face with it at the jail all the time. Uh, you'll ask uh, guys, you know, hey, you ever been saved? Oh, yeah, I've been saved. I'm saved, and uh, a pastor taught me something years ago, and he's just like, always ask him, what did you get saved from? Because most people, it's just, it's good lingo. You know, like, saved, oh yeah, everybody's saved out there. And you know, everybody in America is a Christian now. Yeah. I mean, you can be a Catholic and you're a Christian now, as long as you live here. So, uh, they say they're saved, but I asked them, what did you get saved from? And man, every, the conversation changes. Because you can be sitting there talking about the Bible, what the Lord did for you on the cross, and, and, uh, and everything else. And, and then you ask them what they get saved from, they're like, oh, well, you know, just all the stuff. You know, just rough life and everything. I'm like, you're in jail. You know, and they'll even say, and I had this happen a couple weeks ago when I went with that young guy, literally said, save from a life, alcohol and drugs. And that's the reason he was in there. I'm like, you, you lost it then. Like you didn't get saved that far. So I like to ask, what did you get saved from? I got saved from a lake of fire. I got saved from a second death. I got saved from going to a place called hell. So when it says that it's the act of saving preservation from destruction, danger or great calamity and a deliverance from enemies... I know what all those things are. Jesus Christ delivered us from death, the second death. He delivered us from hell, from the devil's grip, which is our enemy. Uh, and one day he'll deliver us out of this world and out of this sinful flesh, which is our enemies. I have a message I preach called Three Enemies, One Ally. You have the world, the flesh, and the devil. They are always your enemies, but you always have the greatest ally as a Christian. You have God, and he defeated all three he beat the devil when he was tempted of him, right? Uh, he he uh, says, I, I have overcome the world. You know, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Um, so he's conquered these enemies. Uh, in Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, great verses. I think you should have them underlined or, or marked or at least have a note about them. Um, this is a really good passage. And I'll be giving you a, a lot of references. You don't have to turn to all of them. Uh, you, can, you can write them down or just listen and um, you don't have to take my word for them. You can look them up afterwards. That's fine. But uh, because there's so much information about these words in Scripture, it's easier just to sometimes give you the reference, read it, and then kind of move on. So, but I'll have you turn to this. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18 says, And when I saw him, this is John talking, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He's won the victory. He saved us from those things. And so when I say I'm saved, now you know what I'm talking about. When I ask somebody if they're saved, that's kind of generally the answer I want to hear. When they usually backstep and they don't really know, either one, they got saved and they have no idea what they got. Maybe there was a time where they accepted Jesus Christ to be their personal Savior. And they just didn't understand all the transaction that, that, that took place. Maybe they didn't realize, you know, all of the, the deal that they got in on. But I like to then, you know, explain it to them, uh, kind of help them, walk them through it. I'm not trying to 
another word, you know, phrasing we use is retread, you know, where you just like, this guy needs to get saved again. I believe he gets saved once forever. But I want to make sure they have assurance of that salvation. I want to make sure that they know where they're going to go when they draw their last breath. I want to make sure that they know where they will not go when they draw their last breath as a Christian. Um, so yeah, you can lose faith and trust in everything else in God, but he's never going to lose you out of his hand. So salvation. Uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And it has. Every person that's ever lived or breathed is going to have an opportunity based on what dispensation they're in, obviously, to be saved. In this one, the age of grace, or the church age, or whatever, you know, we're under grace, not under the law. Like, you have the opportunity to be saved. Uh, and I don't know how in the world the Lord's going to completely answer all that. I know we're given the conscience uh, is a witness uh, for us, and I know creation is a witness for us. So it doesn't matter what country, what nation, what tribe or fellowship you're with, uh, God has shown himself to you through conscience. Uh, you know what wrong is. I mean, my mom and dad didn't teach me that stealing was wrong. I just knew it. I got a cold sweat when I was taking something that wasn't mine. I knew that being dishonest was wrong. Lying was wrong. Did I know it was a sin? Did I know the wording and the terminology? No. But there wasn't a comfort and a peace when I did something that was wrong. And it was before mom and dad even explained those things to me. And I have to understand and realize and believe the scriptures that every man and woman child has a conscience. And that you have the opportunity to uh, coddle and protect it or to sear it. What the Bible calls about a person being turned over to a reprobate mind. So when I say, you know, hey, you could be a child in a tribe in the middle of Zimbabwe or Africa or whatever. Like, they know right from wrong. They know that is their possessions, not mine. I shouldn't take them. They know killing, stealing, lying, these things, the basics, because that's your conscience. And then creation. Uh, we've got uh, Darwin and everybody else trying to disprove what God did, but... Come on, man. I mean, a big bang? Really? Is that how they build houses nowadays? Do you see them put TNT in the ground with the building supplies? And then they ask, where did the building supplies come from? You know, because everything had to have a start. I've never seen anything blow up and then just pure order come out of it. So, duh. Well, it took millions of years. And I'm like, well, show me some pictures. You know, come on. You know? Yeah. But it takes more faith, I believe, <laughs> to believe in that than it does just to believe in a, a divine creator. You know, there's a watchmaker. That's how the watch works, right? I believe there's a designer, you know. How does the grass know to come back? In what season it comes back? How do animals, the circle of life and everything, and that's even got a curse on it. There shouldn't even be bloodshed. God didn't design it to be that way. But still, there's an order to things. How in the world? There's a designer. So this, the, it says, the, for the grace of God, this is Titus 2.11, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Uh, and I believe 100%, if you want the truth, God will deliver the truth to you. If you want a lie, he will give you every lie out there. He will allow you to be blinded. He'll give you the tools to do it to yourself. Um, you know, it's just that's the way that our God works. He, he, he supports free will. It's your choice. So if you want the truth, he, he'll, he'll, he'll give it to you. Salvation hath appeared to all men. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, now we understand as a, you know, a Christian, when you get saved, salvation, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's going into one body. You have Jew and Gentile in one body. It's the church of God. We understand that, but I'm just covering salvation. I'm not teaching any other lessons this morning. Stay on point. Romans 10.10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession. It is? Oh, thank you. Man, I've got to watch my time here. Romans 10.10, 10, For the, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is a verse, to the best of my knowledge, I think I've quoted this to probably every person I've led to the Lord. This is one of the, I mean, yeah, it's good to take them through the Romans road, but I always like to take them to Romans 10, 9 and 10. I really want them to understand just how simple it is, you know. Uh, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I mean, it's just belief in the heart. Uh, you don't have to, you know, it's repentance from sin, but they think, like, I have to never sin again. It's not even about that. No, 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 it's you putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. My father-in-law, uh, I think, has a very good way of wording it. He said, the greatest day in your life is the day you take God's side against yourself. Man, I, I, first time he said that, I was like, I don't understand. And then I thought about it. Yeah, that's it, man. The greatest day in your life is the day you take God's side against yourself. You're realizing you don't have the answers. You don't have the way to heaven. There's no way in and of yourself to get to heaven. It's his way, and that means you're wrong. <laughs> he
he's right. So you're taking his way. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then, boom, salvation comes on you. Now, salvation is a transaction. That's an instant thing. He's instantly saved your soul. Um, uh, but then also, I mean, you're going to get a new body, too. We'll cover that in some other points. But Acts chapter 4, let's go over to Acts chapter 4. This is a very great passage of Scripture. I like what Peter says here. Acts chapter 4, starting verse 10, verse 10 to 12. There's three words that, uh, that uh, you know, Peter throws in here, and man, you talk about a real dig. I, I think that that hit me pretty deep in the heart if I was standing there listening, listening to him uh, say this. But uh, we'll read it here. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, or 4 verse uh, 10, sorry. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, these are the three words, whom ye crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's through the name of Jesus Christ. So salvation, that's a pretty simple one. If you're a Christian, you've been saved for 20 minutes. You probably understand a little bit about salvation. Uh, now let's talk about the, ne the next one, spiritual circumcision, another ION. These are all going to end in ION. If you have a better title, let me know. We'll change it on the video because I feel like it looks silly. But spiritual circumcision. Now, obviously, you know what circumcision is. It was something uh, given to the, the, uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament, you know, the, uh, you know for, for a man and everything, cut the foreskin off in a certain day. And it was a thing of just cleanliness. It's really all it kind of came down to. And God wanted them to be separate. He wanted them to be different, set apart, uh, unique, a peculiar people, right? These are all reasons. Now, spiritual circumcision, we'll find this in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, it is a procedure that happens, but it's done without hands. Amen. This is something that happens spiritually. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13 says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. This is an operation. I mean, the day you got saved, that place you were in, that was an O.R., that was an operating room. There was something happening spiritually right there. Whether you understood, knew about it, or anything else, God was performing surgery, uh, and he was separating that soul from that body. It says, uh, with, uh, Him through faith, the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now your sin is no longer connected to your soul. The day salvation took place, spiritual circumcision happened. And uh, everything you ever do the rest of your life, as far as sin goes and everything, it does not go to that account. On, uh, it's connected with your soul. Uh, it's, uh, you're sealed. You're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise to the day of redemption. Uh, there's nothing you can do to, to, to filthy that soul up again. Everything that you sinned before then, yes, it was on that. But then God washed that uh, with his blood and he cleansed it. Now when Jesus Christ looks down, he doesn't see you anymore. He sees Jesus Christ because that soul's been cleansed. So spiritual circumcision, there's more about that, but I kept it simple. Now number three, intercession. Now this is something that happens uh, twofold. Uh, you have the Holy Ghost making intercession for you, but then you also have Jesus Christ being the mediator between God and man. The definition of intercession is the act of interceding, mediation, interposition between parties at variance with a view to reconciliation. Romans chapter 8. Let's go over to Romans chapter 8. X Romans. Romans chapter 8. There's, there's a lot of IONs in the Bible. There's like way more than what I'm going to touch, but I feel like this is a good, um, it's a good base. This is a good foundation, a good starting point to understand things um, as a Christian. And like I said, probably I would say the average age of a Christian in here is probably close to 20 years old, at least, I would think. Most people have probably been saved. There's some maybe been saved in here a year or two or five years. There's also some people that have been saved in here close to 40 years. So I think probably averages out to about 20. You all probably know these things, but I'm just refreshing you. You know, sometimes the house gets dirty and you've got to pressure wash it off. So uh, the act of interceding, mediation, interposition between parties at variance. And boy, you were at enmity between God. Uh, or there was enmity between you and God uh, before you got saved. And Romans chapter 8 
uh, verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, isn't it interesting how the sinner's prayer is different out of every man's mouth? It comes different out of every woman's mouth, every child's mouth. I don't know that any, any person, any two people have ever prayed the exact prayer. Uh, because I can't hear your heart, first off, you know, and you might not have actually been vocal about it, or I wasn't there when it happened. I, I just think everyone is, is unique. There are some, literally, I mean, deathbed confession. God, please save me. I know I'm a sinner. I mean, they know it. They understood it. They've heard the gospel. Maybe they were raised in church. Uh, and then you have somebody else over there. They probably got saved as they started praying because they already had the belief in their heart and they had already had confession and everything. But they got into a 15-minute prayer, you know, crying and bawling and squalling. Thanks, God, for dying on the cross. That's totally different than the guy that just, I mean, just like a couple, is almost like a Nehemiah prayer. But yet, all those things come to the Father the same. It's a sinner. He's lost. He needs to be saved. He's condemned to hell. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I can save him. I mean, it comes to the Father the same, and it's through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is making, and that's great, because I don't always know the right words to pray. I don't even know all, when a certain situation happens, uh, what specifically to ask God. You know, somebody gets injured, I'm like, God, I, yeah, give the doctors wisdom and give, you know, help out. And, you know, I'm not like, Lord, please block infection. Can you? I, mean, I don't know specific, but God, can you please have mercy, mercy in this situation? Can you please have grace? Can you help the family? Uh, this is a time of need, God. We need you. Can you please come down and help? And the Holy Spirit's got the right words, man. He's get, he's, he gets it to the Father, and the Father says, Intercession with us in groanings which cannot be uttered at the end of verse 27. It says, For the saints, according to the will of God. I don't always pray according to the will of God, but I sure want them to answer according to the will of God, you know? Uh, ask and you shall receive. You know, I, I pastor mentions every once in a while, he's like, hey, you know, i got to at least ask for a million dollars. You know, you never know if you'll get it or not, but, but I want it to be done, done according to God's will. Please answer the prayer. Get it to the Father according to your will, because if I would destroy my life and you have foreknowledge and you know that, please answer my prayer not according to how I want it answered. You know, <laughs> make those groanings which cannot be uttered. So the, the Holy Spirit's uh, a lot smarter than us. You get down to verse 34, it says, who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? And that's where I got to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, one of the best verses in the Bible. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's one way. Uh, if you're, if you're going to get to heaven, it's through one man. Uh, if you're going to pray, yes, the Holy Spirit's going to get that to God, but man, there's one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. Now you start dabbling into the Trinity a little bit, but we're not studying that today, amen? 1 Timothy 2.5, that's a good one. For there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And that's intercession briefly. These are all nutshells. Uh, like I said, they show up in Scripture uh, many, many different ways. Um, these are the word in and of himself with I-O-N. Um, You'll see, we'll, we'll get down to, you know, justification. Uh, but justifies in the Bible, justifying, justifieth, you know, these are all things. We're looking at the word as I-O-N because they show up in Scripture sometimes that way. And so we have uh, salvation, which happens, transaction, spiritual circumcision, that's immediate. That happened the same time. Pastor has a list of how many things that happened the, the day you got saved. I mean, 25, but there's probably, you know, 100 <laughs> or more things that happened the moment you got saved. And all you maybe knew at that time was not going to hell. Yeah. And then you found out, wait, I'm going to heaven. Oh, wait, I'm already seated in heavenly places. Wait, I'm going to have a new body. Wait, I got a mansion coming. Are you kidding? You know, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on. So, uh, but that was something that, that was, uh, would be, was made possible because Jesus Christ, he made intercession for us. Number four, I'm talking fast, remission. Remission is to send back. It's abatement, relaxation, release, forgiveness, pardon. I know that's kind of a broad uh, range of things, but remission, you know, to remit, to, you know, take back something, uh, uh, or take it away, take it out of the way. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, this is a very good verse uh, to give somebody as you're leading them to the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 9, 22. It takes blood to pay for sin. Um, 
The Bible says, For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. We know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. The wages of sin is death. There's a payment for it. There's a payment for it. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Mm -hmm. That's good, without the shedding of blood. Now, uh, I remember my dad using this in a message years and years ago. And he talked about um, uh, coming up to a car wreck, and he said, uh, you never hear somebody come up to a car wreck and look down and see blood on the ground and call it precious blood. But he said, my God's blood is precious. That blood that flowed down off that cross, the eternal weight that that thing carried, that nobody else's blood has. You know why? Our blood's sin cursed, man. There's sin in it. The Bible says our blood doesn't even get into heaven. The only blood that's in heaven is Jesus Christ. Spring it on the mercy seat. That's the only blood. He's the only person that's ever walked on this planet that has had precious blood, pure blood. I'm like, was it a different color? I don't even know, man. There was no sin connected to it. Amen. That's the blood I needed to get to heaven for remission of sins. It says, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now you have a choice now. You can pay for your own sins with not precious blood, with your own blood. And you know how long that takes you? Forever. In a lake of fire. Or you can use precious blood. And man, it just, it didn't even need the full three days. But he wanted to, you know, he did some other things during that three days. Ministered to the saints down there in Abraham's bosom and led captivity captive. I think he had a little meeting with death and, and the devil said, hey, I think you got some keys that belong to me now. You know, so there were some things that happened, but instantly he won that with precious blood. And he paid an eternal payment instantly. Well, he was eternal. That's why. Amen. He hadn't sinned. That's how he could raise again. The Bible says he laid down his life willingly. You say, well, how did Jesus Christ die? Because he became sin. Who knew no sin? He took our sin. Now you say, well, who killed Christ? You did. Yeah, I know the Romans drove the spikes. I know the Jews were consenting to his death, but my sin is what killed him. He willingly took it. So now I understand that he paid for it. He took it. That's what killed him. And he rose again because never sinned. He dropped that sin off. He said, paid for, there you go. You can stay there for all of eternity. And anybody that doesn't want to take this free payment, that's where you'll spend eternity. It's very simple. The gospel is first grade level, man. I mean, even before that. I mean, how old were you when you got, was you four years old? Four years old when you got saved. She understood, man. Understood she was a sinner. Understood the payment for sin and said, there's a way out. That's, it. that's literally it. It's so easy. It's so simple. Eternal life is a free gift and it's been given to all men if you'll have it. You have to accept it. I can leave this thing here all day and say it's yours to take, but it's not really yours until you take it, is it? It's not really yours until you receive it. So God has done that. When it says uh, salvation hath appeared to all men, it's freely there for you to receive, but you have to receive it. And they say, I'll find my own way. No, you'll find your own way to hell is what you'll do. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. So remission of sins, to send, send back abatement, relaxation, release, forgiveness, pardon, and it says, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Acts chapter 10, verse 42 and 43. Acts 10, 42 and 43 says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead, to give him all the prophets witness, and through his name, whosoever believeth on him shall receive remission of sins. Now we know what it's talking about. The remission of sins. It's gone. It says, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Remission of what? Remission of sins. Mm -hmm. They're gone. They're taken away. They're paid for. Amen? Amen? That's remission. All right, number five. Imputation. This is a fun one. This is just an interesting word. I don't know. It's spelled different. I, the only time I've ever heard it is when we're talking about the Bible things. You know, when we're talking about the Bible and, and it's in Scripture. Imputation. The act of imputing. Okay, what's that mean? Which is cha charging to the account of. Attributing or ascribing. Okay, so when you impute something unto someone, you're putting it on their account. You're attributing it to them. You're ascribing it to them. Now I understand what imputation means. All right, Romans chapter 5, verse 13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is or when there is no law. Now, there's two cases I can think of where this is possible. You have no knowledge of the law before you reach, we call it the age of accountability, when you understand that you're a sinner. You know, before that, God is a just God. He's not going to send somebody to hell that does not know. Uh, I believe it applies to somebody that genuinely is a mentally handicapped person and has no knowledge of sin, no knowledge of the law. How in the world could God hold someone accountable that has never understood what that is? 
Same for a baby or a child, right, under that age. And it also applies to the Christian because I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. Free from the law, oh, happy condition. We sing songs about it. I'm not under the law anymore. So it says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Guess what? I'm free, man. There is no law that I am under anymore. I am free from sin, okay? People say free from the law. Now I have the liberty to sin. No, <laughs> that's where, where Paul says, you know, use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh. No, 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 I'm free. I'm not bound to it anymore. You have to realize before I got saved, sinning was the only thing I could do because right. I didn't have any righteousness of God in me. But once I got saved, now I have a choice. I can actually do something for him, yeah. not for myself. And now I can actually do something that's not sin. Do you realize a person that's never been saved is nothing but a sinner? That is 100% of their character, their makeup. They could be a good person, and in the background, there's pride, something's involved. It's sin. It's filthiness in God's eyes. He doesn't like it. It stinks. But, for a Christian, sin's not even imputed to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, To wit, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Not imputing, do you notice it's their trespasses unto them? It's stuff that they're committing, they deserve to pay for it. It's already paid for. Amen? Romans chapter 4. Let's go ahead and go over to Romans 4. Romans chapter 4, I have a few verses here I'm going to read. And this is imputation. Um, <clears throat> we're going to find out that uh, there's two different things that are imputed here. I don't know if everybody knew that or not. There's two different things that are imputed. Uh, one is, uh, we just read about it, the sin is not imputed to your account. The sin is not on your account anymore. It's clean, right? Uh, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be, uh, oh, I'm going to misquote the verse, they shall be as wool, yeah. Or though, though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as snow. White as snow. The, yeah, oh man, I'm misquoting it. Can you look that up for me? You're the, you're the verse looker up guy. I can't even quote it. Oh, man. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white. Because uh, it says white. Uh, wool and scarlet. And, and they shall be as wool. Thank you. So they, though your sins be as scarlet. There's a song. <laughs> though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white. White as the snow, though they be Red like crimson, they shall be as wool, white wool, right? Okay, totally destroyed that. But um, Christ, I don't even, I lost my train of thought now that I've chased that rabbit. What? Yeah, I'm in, yeah, I'm in Romans 4. I'm going to read that now. But um, what I was saying was that the, uh, the, the sin that, that's, that should be on your account is no longer on your account. It's not imputed unto you. You are white as wool. Okay, I guess that's what I was trying to get to. Like, yes, you were blood red with sin, right? Sins, uh, sins in the blood. Uh, uh, our, our blood, the, we don't have precious blood. It's tainted. Yes, thank you. There we go. And, uh, but uh, the, the moment you got saved, it's as if God doesn't even see your blood anymore. He sees his son's blood. It's pure. It's clean. It's washed. It's, it's, it's as wool. It's white as snow, like it says in that verse. Whatever that verse is that I totally destroyed just now. Romans chapter 4. So the first thing is, that your sin is not imputed under your account. The second thing is Christ's righteousness is imputed to your account. Romans chapter 4, verse 20 to 25. Romans 4, verse 20 to the, to, the, to the end of the verse. It says, He staggered not, and this is talking about Abraham, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what He had promised, He was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. See how it was imputed into him for righteousness, that faith? Now, the funny thing about this is, Abraham had his own faith in God. We are given faith as a free gift from God, uh, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
So we understand that uh, God not only gives us the faith, but then he rewards us. It's the belief we're getting rewarded for. It's the trust and the belief in Christ. You realize, I'm not the way to the Father. You are, and you accept Jesus Christ. And now his righteousness is imputed unto your account, and your sin and filth and unrighteousness is imputed unto him. And he already paid for it. It's already paid for. Amen? So uh, that's the imputation there. There's two things that happen. It's kind of a two-way transaction. You trade your filth for his glory, and he gave you his glory for our filth. And he could pay for it, man. Amen? Amen. So imputation. Uh, Number six, justification. The act of justifying, a showing to be uh, just or conformable to law, absolution. Romans chapter 5, right there. Romans 5, verse 15. Read Romans 5, verse 15 to 18. It says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Justification, you know, Uh, To think that we are completely and fully justified. He says the justification of life, it's justified for us to even be living right now because of Jesus Christ. Like, with there being sin on your account, you don't even deserve to breathe. You don't deserve to live. You deserve nothing but eternal death. Uh, According to the scriptures, that's what you've earned. That's what uh, you have to pay for. But because of Christ and what he did, and he took our offenses out of the way, and our trespasses, our iniquities, our sins our wrongs, right? He took those, paid for them, and now we have justification to live. Uh, Not only to serve Him, but we have justification to spend eternity with Him in glory. Justification in a nutshell. There you go. Number seven, reconciliation. All these IONs, there's so many in Scripture, so many more than this, it's funny. Reconciliation, the act of reconciling parties at variance, renewal of friendship after disagreement or enmity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I tried to, uh, I tried to keep most all these into, the, into New Testament uh, scriptures. A lot of these uh, show up, uh, portions of them show up in, in, in Old Testament. Obviously, he was just talking about Abraham there. I mean, that was righteousness. It was imputed into his account. Uh, the reason I'm not you know, using those is because we're in church age. I'm trying to keep the doctrine straight and everything. But uh, if it lines up with Pauline doctrine, it lines up with it. Amen? So that's, that's something we can use. There's things I like in the book of James and 1 Peter and the book of Hebrews and everything else. If it lines up with Paul's preaching, that's what I'll, I'll apply to me. Amen. Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. He's the one that preached to the churches. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the church. So, Reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll start in verse 18. We'll read down to the end of the chapter here too. Uh, in all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And that, honestly, that'd be enough right there. <laughs> it says, And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Uh, he's, he's trying to draw all men. Amen? Uh, he's trying to reconcile all, but, uh, all men, but uh, only those who accept him are reconciled. Now, in verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And you notice some of these verses, the overlapping of them, uh, where we're going to find some of the same words because it's, it's, all of this has happened at the same time. This all happened the day you got saved. You got 
salvation, spiritual circumcision, Christ made intercession, the Holy Spirit made intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. You had remission of sins. You had the imputation of Christ's righteousness on your account, your sin taken off your account. You had the justification, and then you had reconciliation with God. So these are all things that happened at the same time, so don't be surprised as we read through, especially even when we get into next week, because this will have to carry over, how we're going to start reading some of the same verses. And you're like, oh man, hey, there's that again, you know. Uh, 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 the reconciliation and justification and all these things showing up in the same, uh, same passages. This has all happened already for you as a Christian. It's already taken place. You've already been reconciled to God. Uh, you already uh, have had that, uh, that fellowship restored. You've already uh, begun that relationship uh, again with Christ. Because if you think about it, mankind as a whole, yes, Adam was created as, the, he was called the son of God. He was related to God. And then something happened, and something happened bad that, that separated us from God. Uh, when God says, in the day you eat thereof, you shall die, you shall surely die. Spiritually, yes, they were going to die. Physically, they were going to die. Now you have separation from God now for all of eternity. And Christ had to win that back. He had to reconcile that. He had to make it to where we could be related to him again. Amen? And now I am the son of God, just like Adam was. Only this is spiritual. And this thing will be for eternity. And thank God I can't mess this one up. <laughs> Amen? Uh, I always tell the guys in the jail, I said, when you're born of your mother, you're always related to her, aren't you? I mean, you could even be adopted by somebody else and everything, but her blood is what's give you life. That's what's running through your veins, amen, so to speak. I know you got your own DNA and all, but that's your mother, and nobody can change that. It's, it's, it's impossible. It's the same with Christ. It's so much better, but I'm trying to explain things how Christ did. You know, he'd use parables, and he'd break things down to the simplest uh, of, of, you know, basis things so we could understand it as simple men. I'm a simple man. And he said, uh, uh, I, I said, you know, it's the same thing. You were related to him forever. He is your eternal father. He's your heavenly father. Nobody can pluck you out of his hand. That relationship will always be there. The fellowship takes work. That's where, that's where the hard part is. These guys, they think they lost their salvation. Well, I messed up and I sinned again. And I'm like, do you ever get in a fight with your wife in an argument where, hey, you messed up? Yeah, isn't she still your wife? <laughs> same with your kids. They're still your kids, aren't they? Right? Nothing happened with the relationship. It's the fellowship that needs work. The fellowship needs to be restored. So he re reconciled us uh, to God. When we got saved, you're in the family of God forever. You're sealed. You're taken care of. The fellowship, hey, that's a daily battle, man. That's a daily walk. And uh, we'll, we'll go on to the next point with that being said. Sanctification. Number eight, sanctification. The act of making holy. Now, there's two, two applications of sanctification. You've got sanctification on your soul, and then we'll talk about the sanctification of the body, and then we may be finishing up. Uh, you have uh, the soul. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 it says, by the, which we, uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, that's an instant transaction. That's the day you got saved, the salvation, spiritual circumcision, uh, uh, the reconciliation, all those things. That was the sanctification of your soul. It's pure. It's clean. It can't be touched by the devil. It can't be touched by the world. It can't be touched by your flesh, your sin, anymore. Done. Taken care of. Sanctification of the soul. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now, before we get all Calvinistic on me, we'll get into that a little more later. But it says, uh, the salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. And Spirit, notice, it's, it's, well, I don't know if you got turned there. I read this so fast. It's capital S. The Spirit sanctified you. Amen? Sanctified that, that soul. Now the body. 1 Thessalonians 4.4 4, That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, definition. The act of making holy. The moment you got saved, the soul was made holy. But from then on, man, this flesh. <laughs> It says we're supposed to know, it says, how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. And there's more the scripture says about that, about being sanctified to God. But man, I like to say keeping short accounts. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I just remembered, I can't wait for you to get back to that today. It's a good passage. Amen. But uh, that, that thing is, uh, uh, it's a daily battle. It's a daily battle. I talked about that fellowship with the Lord. The relationship's there. Fellowship takes work. 
and I've got to constantly still be confessing my sins, you know, because we're talking about the body now, not the soul. Soul sins paid for, taken care of. Uh, but I don't like reaping the sins of the flesh, you know. I like reaping the, sin, uh, the, 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 the things of the Spirit, uh, and uh, yet I still sit down here and sow these, these wild seeds and, and reap in this flesh, and uh, I, I want to get those things taken care of. Confess those sins. Keep, keep things good, that relationship restored with you and God. I like doing that also if there's ever a time of need. I don't want to have to get down and confess a bunch of sin between me and my God and make sure the fellowship's restored before I get to ask Him to help me with my time of need. <laughs> I want to be able to get down and, Lord, can you help me in this situation? I know things are good between us because we were just talking a few minutes ago. <laughs> and now I need your help, please, God, uh, in this hour. Uh, so you have the sanctification of the body, and that takes work. That's constantly, wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto and to the, according to thy word. Uh, by just reading, taking it in, praying, staying close to the Lord. I like staying around good influence. I tell these guys, uh, you know, trying to get out of a, a rough situation. They're hanging around the wrong crowd. And a lot of times it's their own family. You've got to get separated from that, man. You have to get some better influence. And then I tell them, there's a bunch of dirtbags in church too, man. But... Some of those dirtbags are trying, <laughs> you know. At least they're maybe getting in the scripture. Maybe they're praying. Hey, they're showing up to church. They're not at the bar on Saturday night. I know that much because I don't think anybody here has a hangover. Amen? Good. That's great. You know, I like hanging around this influence, not that influence out there. So I'm trying to get, you know, hey, get them grounded. Like you have to, sanctification takes work when it comes to this flesh because I don't got a new body yet. <laughs> I'm waiting on that part. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Don't you just want to be prepared unto every good work? It's a lot more of a peaceable life. <laughs> There's a lot less misery when you're living for the Lord. I sleep a lot better. I really do, you know? Uh, I, you know, I, I just got uh, my neck cracked yesterday, and I hate looking over my shoulder when I go past a state trooper. <laughs> Because I was speeding. Just go the speed limit, man. It's peaceable. I don't have to turn my head, knock my back out of alignment. Pastor, your neck's hurting you. I don't know, man. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, uh, hey, man, sanctification, it takes work. But there's peace involved in it. It's amazing the rewards you get instantly from living for the Lord. But then the stuff you don't even understand you're going to get when you get to heaven. I know we study, we try and research and find out what all is going to happen in the judgment seat of Christ. But, man, I, I you know... You know, you hear the greatest of preachers, the guy gets up and you're like, man, this guy's probably led, you know, 4,000 people to Christ or something. And he's like, oh, I'm just the wickedest of sinners. And if I just have a gold nugget, you know, at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm thinking, that guy's probably got, you know, <laughs> so many crowns full of stuff. And maybe it's false humility. Maybe he's actually that. But I'm like, I think you're going to have more than what you think you're going to have. I really do. Because we, we serve a gracious God. If it took one, and I'm going to call it little choice, I know it's the biggest choice you ever made in your life, but the moment you got saved, that little transaction saved you for all of eternity. You don't think God's going to be a little bit gracious and merciful when it comes to you serving Him? I mean, come on. I think you're going to have some rewards, you know. Uh, just, I think there's going to be a little more rubies and, and gold and jas... Uh, uh, bleh, 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 bleh. I can't even say the word. Jasper and Sapphire, <laughs> or Jaspire. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot more things we're going to be casting at the Lord's feet. I know we talked about those crowns. I think there's going to be a lot of crowns won. I'm looking forward to it. But uh, don't spoil those things. Don't live in sin. Don't lose rewards in heaven. Amen. Uh, just keep on doing something for him. We'll do, we'll do one more. We'll do one more, and then we'll stop. Regeneration, number nine. That, this is halfway point, so that's good. Sanctification, now Regeneration. This is reproduction, the act of producing a new. Uh, in theology, it is the new birth by the grace of God. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Remember, this is to, you know, producing a new. Uh, this says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Appetites change when you get saved, uh, and they should. Uh, that's a really good uh, picture that you got saved. Amen? Uh, the Holy Spirit gets in there and starts convicting you when you're doing wrong and starts telling you, hey, wouldn't you rather do this? You know? Uh, so you start seeing appetites change. Usually appearance changes based on the lifestyle of someone. That's a good thing. Uh, health is restored. You ever notice that? You know, hey, when you give up sin, you get a little healthier. Uh, sin brings, uh, lust when it hath conceived bringeth forth sin. Sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Uh, living in this world will kill you. <laughs> that's, 
That's part of it. The more you live in sin, the shorter your life will be. Even just obedience to parents, right? We learned that in Ephesians 6. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Let's go ahead and flip there. This will be the last passage. Titus chapter 3, verse 3 to 5. You realize so many IONs happened when you got saved, did you? Titus chapter 3, verse 3, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The moment I got saved, regeneration happened, man. Uh, I, was a, I became a new creature. There was something restored in me that I never even actually had. <laughs> Amen? Uh, not in my lifetime, but uh, it's the way God designed it. He wanted to be living inside you. He wanted to have fellowship and communion with you. And uh, regeneration took place. Uh, I was made anew. There's a new creature in me. Uh, there's a new spirit I have. There's uh, a different desires and things that come with that. I still have the old nature, but now I have a new nature, so I'm officially bipolar. <laughs> Amen? This, this flesh is wrestling everything it can to tackle the Spirit, and yet the Spirit's doing the same thing. And uh, Dr. Ruckman said it, Amen. You have two dogs, whichever one you feed is going to win in the fight. And if I'm feeding this flesh every day, and I'm pampering it, and I'm never feeding spiritually the spiritual man, if I'm never in the Word of God, if I'm never showing up to church, if I'm never on my knees... If I'm never putting the Lord in my life, in my mind at all whatsoever, flesh is going to win every day, every battle. That account's just going to stack up, stack up, stack up, stack up. And there's going to be so many sins between me and God. I'm going to be reaping in this flesh, miserable, no peace, uh, no answered prayers. I mean, just, ah, shouldn't be that way. You've been regenerated. Amen. You've been made anew. You've been sanctified. You've been reconciled to God. You've been justified. Uh, you've been spiritually circumcised uh, and you're saved. Salvation took place the moment you got uh, Jesus Christ in your heart. So that's the first half. We'll try and tackle the next half next week. Um, what, uh, I don't remember what time we got back, but I got done studying it after 9 o'clock last night. I started when I got home. And she, my wife's like, I haven't seen you all day. Can we take a walk? So there was a, a walk taken in between there. But when you start getting into this stuff, I'm, just, I'm, I'm hoping this is a help. I can kind of bring all these things into one place and just like refresh you, maybe give you just one verse, because these are things that, you know, I want to be prepared when somebody asks me what that is. Uh, you know, what is imputation and intercession and all these things? We'll get into some more funny words next week, uh, or just unique words, things that we maybe don't use in, in our language every day nowadays. But uh, it's Sunday school. We should learn something. I hope that helped you, and uh, we'll take a break for 10, 15 minutes. Church. All right, you're dismissed.